Our first speaker in the session is Tim Sayer, uh, who is going to be talking about uh, cognitive theories of the relationship between improvisation and why coding. Uh, and Tim is program leader for music performance. Production. Music production at uh, University of St. Martin's St. John Improvement. Okay. Um, a uh, thank you to the uh, to the, the committee for uh, allowing me to come and talk about these things. Um, I have to say at this stage, right off the bat, that um, uh, yesterday I attended uh, the workshop on slowness, and uh, hugely influential to me to the point that um, when I was faced with uh, reducing down my paper to a 15-minute talk, that was a massive problem, and I actually uh, struggled uh, immensely to do that. So. Uh, as a result of going to the, uh, the, the, the workshop on slowness, I tore up the presentation that I was going to do uh, today, and so uh, you're not going to get any of these references to all this stuff. <laughs> We're just going to, uh, because it's just not going to happen in 15, in 15 minutes. And uh, instead, what I'm going to do is, I thought it was a bit ridiculous anyway, I'm presenting a, pa a paper on uh, improvisation, and it's completely scripted. And uh, there, there I am attending a workshop on slowness, and I was going to have to talk at 90 miles an hour to get through this stuff. So um, all I've got is uh, uh, three points that I'm just going to address in, in, in this talk. And uh, also, I thought what I could do is, you can read the paper, so this is kind of like an extended advert for you to go and read the paper. Um, and I would kind of give a bit more of a background to why I've kind of uh, wrote the paper. And, uh, and largely it's to do with my experience as being um, an improvising musician. So I'm a trumpet player, I've been through the kind of, you know, the grade system, so starting off reading music, uh, playing in pop bands and getting a little bit into improvisation, then kind of finding jazz and being inspired by that, and then finding free jazz and being inspired by that, and then finding complete free improvisation and using electronics and so on and so forth. So that's the kind of trajectory that I went through. And um, uh, observing various things uh, uh, along the way. So to start off, um, goal states, in the paper I kind of talk quite a lot about um, the idea that we're in um, pursuance. A lot of our behavior is, of course, kind of uh, in pursuance of certain goal states. And actually, a number of the goal states that we're uh, engaged in, almost like a nested set of loops, um, is, uh, is outside of our conscious awareness. And that, um, um, so I can give you uh, an example. So I'm, I get booked for a gig. Sometimes I do gigs where I'm just filling in for people because they're on holiday or they're ill or something. So I'm doing a gig and it's quite a large stage. It's a 10-piece band and I get there and they say, you're going to wear in-ear monitors for this gig um, because we've, we've dispensed with the, with the on-stage monitors. And it's better because you don't get the back, you know, the, the back line noise and everything. So we're doing the gig and I'm reading music because everybody else knows the stuff, but I'm just deafing. Um, halfway through the first set, uh, in this large auditorium, there's an explosion. So before I know what happens, I'm on the floor and I'm kind of protecting myself. Um, and I I'm waiting, I can feel my you know, adrenaline is up, my heart is, is, is pounding, and I look up and to my amazement, the rest of the band are still playing as if nothing's happened. I thought, this professionalism of this band is amazing. So <laughs> I, got, I got up and I start doing the soul moves, my trumpet and everything. I look out into the audience and everybody is still dancing. And I thought, this is the weirdest experience I've had. And as I looked to the back of the hall, I saw the sound engineers literally falling about laughing. And it dawned on me that I was the only person that heard the explosion because they went through the Indian monitoring system and they just pumped it straight through to me as a joke. Okay? But, <laughs> but, what, but, but what, was, what was amazing to me was that the fact that my full concentration was on reading the music and w within you know, probably a second I was on the floor and I had, no, I had made that choice. The fact that all these various nested kind of uh, goal states are uh, still in existence. I'm still a father, I'm still, you know, maybe I'm an alcoholic, I'm a whatever. They exist in my, in, in, in my being, regardless of what my focus is at, at, at any one time. Um, this, in the paper I talk quite a lot about um, memory and uh, specifically about the acquisition of motor skills and thinking about um, this uh, in relation to uh, the years that people put into learning their, their instruments and, and starting to tease out what this kind of acquisition of motor skills and these goal states have in relation to improvisation when it's in a, a, a live coding con context and how it differs from when we're playing, uh, playing instruments. So, um, so I'm, in a, uh, I'm, I'm doing this blues uh, gig, and there's a guy who's a, a very competent guitarist 
Um, and it's just kind of come to the point in the set where he's going to do a really extended long guitar solo. And I'm inside the stage and the, uh, the owner of the venue comes up to me and says, we've got a bit of a situation that uh, there's a car blocking an exit and there's an emergency, we need to get the car moved and, it, and we think it's one of the bands. So I said to the dr drummer, do you, do you know anything about Blue Passat? He's playing, do you know anything about Blue Passat that's at the front? And he said, I think it's Clive. Clive is the guitarist, just launching into his you know, extended guitar solo. So um, he says, uh, Clive, um, is your Blue Passat out the front? So he's like, yeah, yeah. He says, we need to, we need to move it because it's in the emergency. He says, oh, the keys are in my bag over there. He's carrying on playing. <laughs> so I said, OK, I'll move it. So I get the keys out the bag, and uh, he shouts over to me, uh, uh, something like, um, be careful of sec uh, the second gear because it's really sticky. You know, you'll find it really sticky. Still, <laughs> not not a break in what he's doing. His uh, his his performance can, can you know and. You know, I was thinking, Clive, is your mind really on the job? You know, that you're doing it. It's just like maybe maybe evaluate these people that we, that we see. You know, launch, you know, having so much uh, passion and that they're putting their 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 attention through their instrument. And how much of that is actually just what's uh, you know pre-programmed into their uh, into their um, you know into their motor system? And the uh, Adam yesterday talking about Derek Bailey and his book, which is hugely influential. You can read that book and you can you can hear people. Uh, finding that almost like an ethical problem in what, how can you call a, 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 an art form improvised, which is almost entirely built up of uh, pre-programmed units of information. Uh, Jeff Pressing kind of quantifies this by saying, really, when you get to up to sort of 10 actions a second on an instrument, that you're, what you're doing is almost entirely built up of, of pre-programmed units of, uh, uh, of musical behavior. And it's interesting that as improvising musicians, we, 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 we go up and down that, we traverse that scale and we never feel when we're moving into that mode of, you know, executive mode of organizing stuff and, you know, the actual detail of uh, executing primitive, you know, pr uh, primitive behaviors. Um, so I was thinking uh, last night if I went uh, to one of the live coders who was, you know, intently doing that algorithm and said, we've got a bit of a situation, there's a car out the back and we need it moving, you know, can you do that? I probably would have get, been hit, and hit, hit or something. I was really interested to see you touching on that point of interruption in that kind of in that process when you're in that because you because the capacity to swap out what you're doing at any one point when you're live coding, of course, isn't really there. You can't really be thinking about something. You have to have your attention, your focus, you know, it, it, uh, uh, on what you're doing. Um, in terms of reflexes and reactions, this is a kind of an interesting uh, point because uh, actually uh, reflexes are something which can form part of an instrumentalist's kind of, uh, 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 baggage of, uh, you know, of, of tricks and th things that happen on the stage very, very quickly can be responded to without almost con conscious intervention. That You can kind of engage with stuff that, uh, that's going on. And again, there's a continuum between you know, nothing really is completely reflexive or or, or consciously reactive is a continuum, and we move across that, that uh, continuum. I need to get a drink of water. Can you just I put a little uh, thing on here to just remind me of uh, other little oops, stories that I was might, might uh. so, um, so it's interesting that um, this. Um, um, we have this uh, the, the 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 reactions and pressing um, talks about this uh, fact that when we get to ten actions per second, we're using you know we're we're, we're using up our uh, facility to think, and this idea of having this separation between what we're doing when we're improvising between the execution and the executive control of what's going on is. Uh, I think interesting when it comes to coding because you're in that space continuously and when you're, when you're improvising on an instrument, you're not necessarily in that space. In fact, that space sometimes can be very problematic for improvisers. There's lots of people who, who, who say when you're in that space, that is when you're not necessarily in the, in, in the flow because your thoughts can be disruptive to 
maybe what you're doing in a very fluid way. And for some people, improvising, because they go into that space, can be completely terrifying. If you're not an improviser and you have a, an amazing facility on your instrument, but you take the music away um, and you go into this space where you can just start to uh, make stuff up and you have access to that facility, it becomes uh, 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 very scary. I, I used to run a workshop uh, for, for a short while with some children um, who came from a, a, in a in not a great uh, background and this was a kind of s social uh, program and they gave us some instruments and we did some brass playing and, and, we had, and they had some brass ensemble music and we kind of basically got through at a very, very base level. At the end of each session I used to say, right, let's just put the music away and we're just going to try and do some improvising. And it scared the hell out of them. It's like, no, well, I, no, it's, you know, the, the crutch of the music was gone. So what I worked out was that uh, instead of just saying, right, let's put the music away and let's just like freely improvise, I just I gave them a story. I gave them something, a con something conceptual to hold on to. So I'd, I, I can't remember exactly the story, but it was something like, okay, rem imagine there's a lake and there's some, some rocks in the lake, and when you jump onto a rock, that's your note. You just hold that note on while you're bar balancing on, think about balancing on that rock. Mm -hmm. And then you can jump to another rock and, you, and that represents another note, just hold that note on. And if I point to you, you can jump in the water and you can splash about and you can do what you like and you can climb back on your rock and you can just hold that, uh, hold that note. And out of nowhere, and I, I've got, I've, I, I had the forethought to record it, so I can just play you a little bit of this, um, maybe. See, this went on, and it might need to be very beautiful to uh, you, but to me, it was, a, okay, it was, it was an amazing uh, uh, revelation from these kids who only just started playing their instrument. They could do, you know, basic things. But just by occupying that space, by giving them some conceptu something conceptual. Now, um, it, um, I did my, my first live coding gig. I kind of put my trumpet down. I thought it sounded like a very cool world that you people in, inhabit. And uh, I had the opportunity to... Um, to again fill in for somebody who couldn't who couldn't do a gig at a festival um, and they had a slot in the program and somebody said can you you know I write some music as well so do you fancy writing a piece of music so I thought I'll try some live coding so I got Sonic Pi out I got up to grips with it quite quickly and uh, so and I composed this piece the thing was it was for about eight musicians as well uh, playing and so I had to kind of think of a way of integrating the, what was going on live with it so I created this piece called the Q Garden and uh, it was inside, what I was doing was I was trying to fire off cues. They had a kind of improvised structured score. And when they heard their cue coming from what I was doing, they would follow their instructions on the score. So the bad thing about this was that uh, I only had a half an hour with the ensemble before we actually had to do the gig. So I had to try to explain. They had no idea what coding, anything. So I had to kind of explain what exactly what I was doing. And then the cues were quite simple. And um, what... What I hadn't expected from a cognitive point of view, because I'm normally, I'm used to being on their side. If I'd had the score, that wouldn't have been a problem. Listen for the cue, do some crazy stuff, you know, and then listen for the next cue, do some more stuff. Um, what actually happened was, as I was coding, and I'd, I, it was semi-improvised. I'd had to practice, because to get the syntax right and make sure, you know, I was doing it, I had roughly an idea what I was going to do. What, what, what I hadn't expected was when I started to code, and they heard the cues and they started to play, how off-putting that was to me because I'm, I'm, I just wanted to shut up because I couldn't <laughs> concentrate on what I was doing and, and, and writing the code, which would have completely missed the whole point of the, of, 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 the, of, of the piece. But it just meant that that space, I just needed that cognitive space to be able to have my full capacity 
focused on on what I was doing in order to in order to code. Whereas I know half these guys, you know, could have been, and I've I've done it myself. I've been improvising at a gig and watching a flat screen TV in the corner of the room where the football's been playing. You know, I can you can do it, but. Uh, Coding, it just wasn't uh, possible. So a simple observation, condensed version of my uh, paper, and uh, that's, that's me done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, my hand gesture was to say you had five minutes left. Oh. So, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so if you'd like to talk for another couple of minutes, or oh. someone can ask you a question yeah, yeah, yeah. what you were going to say next. Well, no, you can just, uh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know I was going to say I'm oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, it's just a small observation, really, but um, I think Thor raised a very good point a few years ago in the paper about the distinction between embodied and hermeneutic knowing, and how that might um, be an interesting thing to consider in the uh, um, sort of context of life coding. That seems to touch on some of what you are describing there, the type of concentration that you might have needed when you were doing that Tommy Pie game a more hermeneutic thing where you're trying to hold these, these symbolic structures in place rather than a more embodied thing. Um, it's probably quite an interesting, fuzzy, not continuum, but a territory between the two um, that could be interesting to plumb for life code is to find ways of, of having an embodied form of concentration to kind of switch in and out of as well as a, a symbolic yeah. form. I think, yeah, I think you're right. I think one, what one of the things that occurred to me is, again, from the, the paper yesterday with the Derek Bailey thing, was that actually, uh, for those musicians, when they hit the cue, they were pressing play, not me. They, they were the ones that were pressing play and going into, uh, you know, almost like a, a, something that they'd done, maybe done with me you know, many, many times before. And I was the one that was trying to you know, do something which was, on a conceptual level, very different, you know, very, and I didn't have that really, that facility to go. But I think you're right, some, some form of, I don't know, coding intuition or something that happens, yeah. Um, what I find also interesting, I mean, where does this, this ten tenseness of, of awareness come from where you can't draw yourself back? Because at the source, in the sense of life coding, is this passive receptivity that are you curious about how an algorithm will sound because you don't know it in advance? So um, you are actually your own audience? That should actually happen in improvised music as well, in a certain way, right? I mean, yeah. At least in theory. Um, so to be separate from yourself in a certain way is there in institutionalized in the separation between you and your algorithm in a certain way. You, your motor skills are in the algorithm. Yes. Actually, there should be more space and more time, you know, to deal with car keys and things like that. But yeah, you know, that, but there is a weird tension. Which yes. maybe comes more from the setting, you know, like from having an audience and having to prove something, rather than essential in the uh, in the coding itself. Yes, uh, I agree. Uh, that that the, the 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 locked inness of being in a with an with an instrument. I mean, you. The other thing that that occurred to me is that um, my trumpet isn't going to crash, you know, at any point. So I don't have to worry about that. But that is a like. <laughs> major concern it was for me in that yeah. Sunny Pie gig is that uh, I have this level of fun of of keep of, of, of like behaving functionally to keep things going and uh, you know it, it doesn't exist in that other domain. Tom, yeah. if you have a In, in the Derek Bailey book, there's some really nice quote by uh, Evan Parker talking about uh, th the fact that B 
being being dropped into a shocking situation in terms of improvisation, being dropped into a shocking situation where your reactions and your responses are not what you would normally expect them to be, is 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 quite an interesting intervention that happens in free improvisation, which might also be an interesting intervention that would happen in live coding. But I I guess it's there's n there's not much that's going to happen external apart from what you've done in terms of the algorithm that's feeding back to you, but then that is can be very volatile and unpredictable. So. Um, yeah, I agree. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank again. you. Next speaker is Nick Collins from uh, his reader in composition at Durham University. Uh, Nick is going to talk about the relationship between machine listening and live coding. I know he's an expert on this. Uh, the reason is that, uh, that he did a PhD thesis on this topic. Uh, and it's the only time in my life when not only did the student know more than I did uh, at the end of his thesis uh, about the topic, which is what I expect from a PhD student, but Nick knew more than I did at the beginning of his PhD than I did <laughs> about the topic. So uh, I'm very pleased to hear what he has to say. Thank you for being my supervisor. <laughs> <laughs> um, and a thank you to Alex and Thor for uh, getting this uh, meeting together. Uh, great to be here. Uh, so I'm going to talk about live coding and machine listening. Um, well, come up with your own definition for live coding. Machine listening. Um, human hearing can be modeled via computer. Uh, there's an open question of how far we've really gone. It's a sort of research frontier of are we really managing to do um, human-like object, auditory object recognition within uh, auditory scenes. Um, there's a sort of research frontier there. But there are lots of cases of machine listening technology coming through into software. So here's just one example, Phil McLeod's uh, Tartini program, which is a very great aid to singers with his nice uh, pitch tracking algorithm. Um, so my paper, I'm not going to attempt to uh, just read out the paper or anything. Um, there's two main perspectives in the paper. One is to uh, have live coding control of a machine listening process. And the other, uh, which is perhaps the more novel route, um, may not be the most sensible route, but we'll try it anyway for the fun of it, because it's research, is to have machine listening as the front end of uh, a language. So machine listening to actually control the live coding. There are various precedents. Um, I won't labor the precedents, but um, uh, Dan Stahl uh, has done some nice live performances with beatbox control. Uh, his, his own doctorate was about analysis of beatboxing. So he has this live analysis, uh, and additionally, he can live code uh, structures uh, with that as uh, one input. Uh, Matt Yee King has done some nice stuff working with Finn Peters with um, live code control of algorithms uh, with actual analysis of Finn's playing uh, incorporated. Uh, Alex McLean, Kate Sishio, um, have a recent project where there's a kind of audiovisual feedback loop where they actually perturb a kind of spatial textual language. Uh, with Frederick Olofsson, uh, we toured the world exploring audiovisual feedback loops, and we had both live analysis of the audio and live analysis of the video on two machines. But um, perhaps most pertinent of all is Nick Hanselman's body fuck, uh, brain fuck interface. I don't know if you've seen this video, nice video, where he essentially sort of dances about with computer vision trying to track his whole body, uh, creating the tokens of uh, the brain fuck language to try and write a program. Okay, So that's computer vision to coding, uh, and I'll try and do uh, machine audition to coding in a bit. Uh, just a quick diagram. In Clip Half, we had two laptops. There was an audio laptop, a, a visual laptop. We had analysis of both sides. You get various feedback loops, and you remap everything as you go along, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but what I really want to do is just get on with some examples. Um, and in fact, I'm going to jump out of the PowerPoint in a second. So uh, I'm going to begin with live code control of machine listening. I'm then going to show you a system called Algorithmic. Uh, I'll talk more about it in a bit. Then I'm going to go to the other way around. So I'm going to go to machine listening control uh, of live coding. Some of you might know uh, an app. Uh, it's an iPhone app. It's also a web browser uh, app these days called TopLap App. Uh, and I'm going to show you a version of that where there's a machine listening front end to determine the tokens that the top of that app runs over. And then finally, I'll just do another example. 
uh, and then we might get back to the PowerPoint just to end with. So let's get on with some actual stuff. Uh, the first thing is pretty trivial, so I don't want to labor the point at all. Oh, one moment. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. What could you do in this situation? <coughs> totally quit. <coughs> if this doesn't work, I'll laugh. OK. Um, so here's a bit of code. It happens to involve uh, one of the machine listening unit generators that are in the Super Collider. This is one James McCartney wrote, provided with the original Super Collider, uh, pitch detector. There happens to be some other stuff in there, uh, a bit of synthesis stuff that is influenced in some sense by the pitch detection. So we just run it, um, make sure we're not too loud to start with. So it's feeding back on itself. Now live coding, as Julian has observed, is essentially anticipating in advance the thing you want to change later. So there happens to be one parameter I've given myself, this feedback amount. And if I change it, there's a change of behavior. Okay. Now we could do more profound things. If this was in the context of a, a larger system, I could actually start changing this code. Maybe I change the pitch thing to the Tartini pitch detector or whatever, and then continue on. So that's perhaps the most basic example of just live coding manipulation of some machine listening process. Uh, so I'll move on. The next thing I want to look at is a system called Algorithmic. Um, now, in order to do this, uh, to do this demo, I have to show you my live performance system. Um, it's been used for many years. It may look a bit clunky these days. Essentially, it's a sort of live coding mixer. So I can um, do a kind of code DJing uh, or combined uh, manipulation of the code where you write fragments of code and they'll take a place within the mixer. Alberto de Campo has a version of this for Jitlib, where it's sort of the Jitlib mixer thing. But uh, this is just my own thing. Um, so what I'm going to do um, I suppose I could just check something. Yeah, it's working. So I just ran a quick bit of code. It appeared within the mixer. It gives me a control for the volume. But we'll kill that bit of code. OK, so we're going to run this um, algorithmic system. Now, the algorithmic system, there's a bunch of classes in the background. What it enables me to do is live remixing of a track uh, with machine listening analysis of that track. So the track's going to run, or the machine listening is going to run. Uh, it extracts timbre features, pitch features, rhythmic features, and they're available then to the live coding that can uh, sort of dynamically make this remix. Okay. Well, that's the idea. <laughs> <laughs> Some people are pretty pleased about that. <laughs> so we set up to go. Uh, now, this window has just appeared. It says algorithmic onsets. There's a bunch of onset detectors. Um, some are bandwise, <laughs> bandwise onset detectors. Uh, there's also some specialized kick and snare um, detection algorithms, uh, specifically looking for those sorts of percussive hits. Um, in the style of algorithm, I am going to be dealing with something more percussive. Actually, what I'm going to deal with um, is um, a track by Alex uh, from his Peak Cut. EP. Um, so if all goes to plan, um, right. So here's my live coding mixer. <laughs> yeah, it's there. So there's a bit of Alex. That's the original track. Okay. But we can mute that for now because we want to we want to analyze it and abstract to go off in a sort of remix direction. So I find a bit of code that I can make a bit bigger. Um, 
It just made this whole thing bigger. Let's start with some triggering of stuff. So um, what's going to happen now is I run this bit of code. And it's triggering a sample. And you can see these onsets are being detected in the original track. Uh, the actual onset detector here is the one for um, uh, low frequencies, this one. So I can set its sensitivity. That's what the GUI is for. If we hear back the original, um, the hope is okay. Let's run a few more of these sort of lucky dip things. Okay, so they're tracking different bands of the original. Okay, and the benefit of that is it's quite synchronized with the original. But we can do more abstract things, so that's just onset detection stuff. Uh, we can uh, run beat trackers. which may not always align, but may align. You're at the mercy of how well they match the original. OK. So I'm building up my remix. Uh, let's do something a bit odder. Um, so here's a bit of uh, pitch tracking combined with beat tracking. I'm just running snippets that I've written already, but you can, re you can write new ones live, of course. Uh, so there's loads of examples here. We can take some timbral feature, this timbre KR thing, this particular feature extractor that's running. Uh, or have a sort of LPC analyzer, all sorts of stuff, right? And on it goes. Right? You can hear how the beat tracker isn't always reliable. Of course, you could modify the code to um, so you let through bigger blasts of the original. Anyway, that's the idea. Kill. Right. So that was just a slightly more developed system that was uh, running a bunch of machine listening and then was letting me do some live coding that used the results of that machine listening. Okay. So now we're going to go the other way around. Uh, now we do machine listening and try to use that to um, drive the language, to drive the program. Um, in the paper itself... I've already given a link to this system. It's available right now if you want to try it yourselves, uh, if I can find it. So um, uh, I think I've given a link. Yeah, there. So as long as the internet's working. So here's, a, here's an actual version from the web. Uh, oh, except that it I need to go to Chrome. just behaves better. So it's Web Audio API. You have to al allow it to use the microphone. You can see it's now using my inbuilt mic, and it's detecting spectral centroid and spectral percentile. Because this is all just JavaScript, I mean, the code's there. If you want to know how to do machine listening via Web Audio API, this essentially gives you the solution straight away. Um, so uh, yeah, there's some detections. Now, the idea is, here's the TopLap app, or at least the sort of web browser version. You can see it's ticking along. Actually, the choice of token from the six uh, available, the six instructions available, and also the parameter setting, uh, these parameters, 
um, is determined by my voice. Okay? So if I start trying, I can try different things. Uh, we could make it silent for a sec so I can talk over the top. Um, so the idea is to get away from the drag and drop old way of um, uh, modifying this machine. I set the update really, really slow, and then I could just use it in the old way. Uh, or we could set the updating of the state to go pretty quick, and it's following machine listening, and it can enable me to uh, dynamically make programs in a very different way. <laughs> And if, if you try and zero it out, immediately <laughs> new things are arising. Okay. Uh, so that's another example. And in my final example, we've got five minutes left. I think this will work to time. Back to Super Collider. Uh, So what I've got is a little um, mini language. It's de defined in the paper. Um, and my voice again is being tracked. And maybe I should run it a bit slower. Oh, slower. <laughs> and so if I hopefully... <laughs> I should be able to change the instructions which in turn then lead to the changing of the behavior over the data array uh, with various random jumps or um, copy and paste type operations or whatever that follows from whatever the program is over here. So program data, program determined by voice. But it's always fun, fun if you just go as quickly as possible and just try and uh, modulate it. Okay. Now you might think that's a totally crazy and pointless example, but um, it's the future. <laughs> <laughs> um, the reviewers, thank you reviewers of the paper, asked me to be more speculative. Uh, <laughs> so um, one way I see live coding going is more speech recognition. We don't have enough speech recognition right now. That can free you up on stage. Uh, the only thing with speech recognition is trying to get the right kinds of parentheses, like you're going brace and write uh, parenthesis and all the rest to be properly recognized. Uh, but uh, yeah, speech recognition front ends. Um, you can live code an actual machine listening algorithm. I could sit here in front of you and entertain you by building a new onset detector. Uh, but I'd not, it could, might take a little while. At Transmedia Al, when we had that big laptop <laughs> gig, I did, I did code up a new um, synthesis UGen but it took about 50 minutes. I might be a little bit quicker these days, but it's not the fastest sort of performance thing. Um, one thing I'm very interested in uh, in research is algorithmic critics at the moment. Uh, I think we're moving into a world of training up stuff on much bigger databases. So with current HSC projects and the like, we sort of deal with audio databases of a week worth of audio and then start doing analysis across that. Um, similarly, if you've got a massive corpus, uh, and Steve alluded to this, of... Uh, live coding performances, you can try and train up uh, from this data to make critics. I like the idea of the critics sitting over your shoulders, uh, not just anticipating what you're going to do next, but actually critiquing it and saying, that was a really bad decision. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't have done that. <laughs> Here's an alternative pathway that you could have taken that's much better. But it's too late. <laughs> 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 um, divergence from the human ear is always a possibility, um, because we've got all these robots that are going to be coming. They may have their own notions of, of listening. They may go through this singularity thing and develop their own culture much more quickly and in much more interesting ways than we could ever appreciate. And finally, uh, what I really think is going to happen is perhaps more personalized languages of live coding. So if you want to come up with your own um, private language as a child, you sort of come up with your own stuff. And um, uh, there's a way in which perhaps you can incorporate that into future programming languages, uh, maybe developing them from a young age. Yep. Okay, so in conclusion, 
Machine listening algorithms naturally occur in contemporary computer music. And machine listening can also form a novel interface for live coding. And I've shoved Alex and Thor there. Just It doesn't mean that they um, are actually supporting my conclusions. <laughs> 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 They're just there. So uh, thank you. speed up that process of developing your own um, private language. Um, so you're, you're absolutely right. There's all sorts of machinery that we can actually bring to bear uh, on that. But I, I guess I just wanted to show some small initial examples to go get the ideas from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so our final speaker is Shivani Mori from the University of Florence, uh, and he'll be speaking about the fantastic Italian electronic music pioneer, Pietro Grossi. So please, to hear more about this. Hello, everyone. No, no audio, thanks. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm here to present my paper about Pietro Grossi, one of the computer music pioneers in Italy during the 1960s. Um, in my opinion, his work is very important for live coding developing because all the software and all the processes that he employed for making music has very similar approach to that of live coders. In fact, in my paper, I have defined him as a proto-live coder. Live coder. Uh, then, let me first briefly introduce his biography and works, and then I will speak about the long-distance relationship between him and live coders' work. Pietro Grossi was born in Venice in 1917. After a brilliant career in the Maggio Musicale Fiorentino's Orchestra, that is one of the most important in Italy, as a first cello, he began to be interested in electronic music during the early 1960s. In 1962, in fact, he was guested by the well-known Rai Studio di Phonologia Musicale in Milan. Here, in 15 days, he recorded his first electronic music piece, called Progetto 2-3, that is Project 2-3 in English. After this experience, he founded his personal electro electronic music studio in Florence, called S2FM one of the first private owned in Europe. Here he experimented music composition using mathematical pro, uh, procedures, and then he developed an interest in algorithmic music, already present is in, in his previous instrumental compositions. Uh, from then, the passage to the computer was near, and in 1967, he began to collaborate with Olivetti General Electric, which had his research and development department near Milan. For two years, he worked there assisted by an engineer who helped him to program the calculator and to insert the data inside it through a big amount of punched cards. This help was crucial because at that time, Grossi was not able to program by himself. He started to learn programming language only later, as I will explain soon. Uh, after these two years of experiments, he managed to be enrolled in the National Research Committee, CNR, in Pisa, uh, linked to IBM R&D Center, based in the same building complex. Here, he was provided with a vi video terminal with alphanumeric keyboard, a very innovative 
device for those years linked to, to a big mainframe computer, the IBM 7090. Uh, thanks to this hardware, he was able to work on his projects. However, he was an informatic illiterate still, and then he started to learn Fortran. Uh, his first creation was DCMP, that stands for Digital Computer Music Program. Uh, this, this software was designed uh, to produce and reproduce music in real time by giving to the computer the appropriate instruction, naturally. Uh, a very important feature is the immediate execution of every command typed uh, by the musician on the keyboard, uh, in a similar way to that of live coders. <coughs> it was sufficient uh, to type the instruction and then the result immediately came out. It was possible to write a piece of music and to reproduce it in various ways. Uh, it was also possible to start uh, an automatic process based on stochastic algorithms to let the computer decide, decide itself the sonic result. Uh, in, in this first experimental phase, because of the lack of calculation resources, the music made has only one timbre uh, and only one melodic line. Uh, neither was it possible to modify the sound out output while the process was running. Uh, uh, technology improvements and continuous research led to the construction in 1975 of a new digitally controlled synthesizer called Tau II. Uh, engineers of the CNR employed the latest technology developed inside the center itself for its construction. Tau II was capable of reproducing up to 12 voices contemporarily, grouped in three different tim timbre categories. For managing this new device, Grossi wrote a new music program called Tau Muse, based on the previous DCMP, but with an enhanced characteristics. With the Tau Muse, it was possible to work also on timbre and on the number of voices. Therefore, it can produce complex and polyphonic piece of music. However, the live coding approach remained the same and the previous textual interface did not change. A new feature was added to, to the Tau Muse in the 1980s, the possibility to manage the program and then the synthesizer from a remote terminal. The software that had this duty was called TeleTau, uh, that it worked and, and it worked through a telephone connection between terminal, the terminal and the IBM computer in Pisa. <coughs> in the 1980s, the CNR became a bit net network node, and from then on, it was possible to play Tau Chu and TeleTau from uh, every terminal linked to that network. Uh, this feature was implemented thanks to Gross's previous experiences of telematic music started in 1970. Precisely in, the, in that year, he made his first experiment of this kind in the world, between Rimini, where Grossi was speaking at, at a conference, and Pisa. In this occasion, the musician was able to reproduce and, uh, some pieces of music by sending the instruction to the calculator in Pisa through a telephone connection and to get back the result through a radio bridge provided by RAI, the Italian uh, public broadcasting company. This innovative way of playing music is very similar to that adapted some time by live coding uh, in the live coding domain. In fact, live coders can meet on a remote server and from where they are interact with each other. I assisted to this kind of performance during a network music festival event in Birmingham, where Alex McLean, David Ogborn, and Eldad Sabari played from distant places. However, there are also some other examples that I do not cite for not good over the time limits. Uh, the last grosses practice uh, I would like to introduce is the real-time image elaboration. 
At the end of the 1980s, the Tower 2 was dismissed because it was becoming obsolete and many bugs emerged. Uh, then Grossi asked for a new synthesizer, but the interest in this kind of experiments had lowered inside the CNR steering committee, unfortunately. Therefore, Grossi decided in a first mov moment to move to Florence, where another CNR institute accepted to build a him a new synthesizer called Irmuse. Unfortunately, it were not very powerful and stimulant, and then he decided to quit after a few years in the Florentine Research Center. In those years, a new and innovative device have, had begun to spread in the Western world, the personal computer. Grossi decided to buy one, a Commodore 64. After a short period, he, become, he becomes aware uh, that this PC was more powerful on the video than on the audio side, and then he decided to experiment in this direction. For doing this, he adapted his previous musical programs for the new heart, but he lived and altered the basic principles, immediacy, interactivity, automaticity of processes. This kind of practice foresee the one that is also present in the live coding domain, although on a lesser degree in respect of music. Uh, in fact, during an algorave held in Lisbon in November 2014, and also on the algorave uh, uh, in Sheffield uh, last week, uh, I see for the first time live coded image proce processing coupled with the computer music. It was a performance <coughs> held by a duo, a duo called the Rebel Scum, that uh, one, one component see it's here, uh, it was a performance, a performance, uh, no, her, here the visual performer constructed his images real time, showing the evolving code above them. However, I have not treated this aspect extensively in my article, and I hope to have the occasion to deepen this link between Grossi and live coding further. After this brief synthesis about Grossi's biography and work, I would like to compare better the Italian musicians and the live coders' working modalities. Uh, the thing that uh, struck me the most during my first live coding concert was the fact that that performers had chosen to project their screen for transparency's sake. This characteristic that is unique in computer music enabled me to understand how music program employed uh, looked like and how the performance process evolved. Almost immediately, I realized that the textual interface resa resembled very close, closely the one used by Pietro Grossi and his program and this, and this is the, the first thing in common. Uh, therefore, Grossi chose not to develop physical um, or graphical interfaces, because in this way he could variate easily and accurately the sound parameters and extend the performing process almost without limits. Live coders use the textual interface practically for the same reason, precision and extreme accuracy in defining the sound parameters during performance, the possibility to experience artificial creativity when they type something without knowing and expecting a precise result. Therefore, in Grossi's and in live coders' view, the text is the main referent for the music heard. In both cases, the perspective is more that of the programmer than that of the performer, because there is not a correspondence between the gestures acted uh, and the music heard. Uh, there could be sometimes this link uh, as in Alexandra's case, for example, um, but only when physical devices are employed. However, in both cases, the written program represents the, the music ideas, and this aspect is for sure present in Grossi's performing modality as well. Grossi is, as the live coders, a figure that stands somewhere between the world of musicians 
and that of, progr that of programmers and that of instrument makers. In both cases, in fact, the artist has constructed his or her instrument. I know that not all the live coders have written the software they play with, but Grossi, as well, was struggling to spread his, program, his programs around and to enlarge the community of users uh, and developers. The Teletau program went exactly in this direction. Another aspect in common, in common that I wish to underline is the effort to obtain real-time sound elaboration, even from remo remote places. In fact, we can state that Grossi was the first to play telematic music. His ground groundbreaking ex experience from Rimini to Pisa was the first document documented event in this field. Live coders hold regularly similar performances all around the world. Now it, look like it, it looks like quite normal and easy task to do, but then in the 1970s there were no internet and the telecommunication technology was very limited. Surely Grossi ha has begun to trace the line for, for this new expression possibility. However, the Italian musician used the network in a different way. In fact, live coder seems not to give too much importance to, to the physical presence in, perform in the performing context, while Grossi instead preferred to be present where the music was heard. Probably at that time, the audience was not accustomed to, be, to experience a detached human presence, and Grossi needed to be there if he would be believed. The Italian musician was very innovative e even on the working metal side. In fact, he had always struggled, at least from his electronic music phase on, to build a collaborative team around his projects. When he began to experiment on his own uh, on the Commodore 64, he tried immediately to find people to share, to share his work with. Uh, in fact, when the internet entered in the Italian market, he immediately pu put it online his personal site. Every visitor could download his program without cost, and after that, they were invited to use, modify, and share again them. This hacker behavior, in Richard Stallman's sense uh, the of the world, is quite the same of many live coders, who relays uh, their personal software under open source or free software license and uh, to let the user be able to develop the program and contribute, contribute to its improvements. Last but not least, I would cite the case of the so-called Modellini Modulanti. They were a sort, uh, they were a sort of ta Taumius patches employed for the real-time modification of any sound characteristic. In fact, the performer had not the possibility to change the sound flux when it, wa when it was already started. The Modellini had precisely this duty. Uh, they modified the sound output on the fly. Uh, yeah. uh, they are very important too early. They are very important uh, in my perspective because they have transformed a compositional process in a performative one. Then they are symptomatic of a grossly strong interest in employing the computer as a real music instrument, a device, or, or better, a device able to translate music thoughts in sounds in a performative way. Therefore, thanks to, the, to their real-time effect, on sound output, the Modellini get Grossi and live coders in close contact. To conclude, I would like to recapitulate all the common aspects between Pietro Grossi and live coders music practice. The first is the text important for the music production that led to an instrumental interface based on text and also to a lack of correspondence between gestures and sound heard. Two, music made through a wired or wireless connection between two distant points, or better, telematic music. 
Three, a work in philosophy based on community, sharing of knowledge, horizontality, uh, very similar to that promo promoted of the so uh, by the so-called hackers, both in the left-wing libertarian and in the right-wing liberal side of the movement. Therefore, I stated, as I stated at the beginning, I believe that it would be fair to, to define Grossi as a proto-life coder. Thank you for the attention. Yeah. Something on the, or contra, on the contrary, was this something that he was kind of doing? When when as you, a renegade? yeah, we we before uh, he was admitted uh, at the CNR in Pisa, he was uh, an independent researcher. Uh, I have said that uh, he built his uh, first uh, private home studio in uh, 1963, for example. Uh, after the 70s, he was admitted at Pisa, uh, in Pisa and uh, he was supported by the institution very, very heavily. Uh, the institution built him uh, the f this first synthesizer I speak of uh, called Tao Chu, and uh, uh, in, it provided him uh, with technicians, with uh, engineers, etc. So. He, he was very well supported in this period. After the 80s, instead, uh, he returned back to, to the 60s situation. Uh, he returned to be an independent researcher, and he worked alone uh, at home uh, with uh, his PC, especially when he worked uh, with, uh, with images. In fact, uh, he called this, uh, this art form home art, art to make at home. So. Uh, in this period, uh, he was not very supportive. No. Thank you very much. I would like to thank Giovanni and all the speakers for keeping so well signed in the session. <laughs>